Welcome our special guest, Brad Weber, um, writer for the Rotarian Magazine. Um, Brad, I don't know if you want to say a quick hello, otherwise I will move along. Brad had said- Hi there, can you hear me? Oh yeah, there we go. Hey, Brad, thanks so thanks much. For, for thanks for letting me lurk in the background, folks. <laughs> but do, good. please do your own thing. Don't mind me. Thanks. Thanks for lurking. <laughs> Um, okay, so a couple of announcements um, and programs. So the uh, Share the Love campaign, the District 5960 fundraising campaign for the month of February, everyone will be super excited to know has been extended for a week until March 7th. Um, the goal is 200,000 uh, for the district. We are a little short. And so um, we're looking for um, any additional donations. If you remember, if you haven't donated, I know that there's a goal for um, you know, participation at any level. So it does not have to be a lot. They have the $365 promotion again um, for the Paul Harris Fellow, making up the difference of the usual $1,000 with um, points from the district. And um, the donation link is right on the bottom there, rotary.org slash en slash donate. So if... Uh, yeah, Greg just um, chimed in that he had made a donation a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. I also made a donation a couple of weeks ago. So would love 100% participation if people um, feel like uh, chipping in even five, 10 or $20, 5, 10, 15. Okay. So um, another thing I wanted to call out was we talked about this at our club organizational meeting um, last month, the Butterfly Service Project. So this is something that Lindy um, brought up at the meeting, has a strong interest in, and this is creating, a, Lindy, if, you, uh, if you're there, if you wanna say a few words, it's creating a butterfly, help me out here, highway, corridor. Yeah, you got it. Yep, uh, um, from basically the Mexican border up to, up to, uh, up to the Northern States. And this is, uh, I was talking with Lindy after the meeting last time, but this is, um, this is sort of a big national effort. This is an organization that has, this is their goal that we would partner with or contribute with. Can you say a little bit more about that? I was hoping we could partner with them since they have already worked with the different organizations to, and communities to work with land. And I, think that they're doing the work as well to make sure that butterflies don't just get clobbered by vehicles up and down Highway 35W. So I assume they're doing this in a way that's maybe not just down the center of the highway, it's on the shoulder, but yeah. it's, it's not, I think it's a for all pollinators as well as the monarchs, but there's a real problem with the monarchs. We've lost about 26% of the population this year, I believe. So yeah, it's uh, there's a news article. It's funny we were talking about this, and I had happened to have seen a news article like two days earlier about the big decline. I think they've been on the decline in the past number of years, not just this past year. So, yeah. great so on our food supply, not have if our pollinators pollinators are in danger or being affected by pesticides, it really affects all of us in our global food supply. What were you going to say, Marlene? Well, you hit me right in the heart, Lindy. Thank you. That's my that's our project, Operation Pollination. Go to operationpollination.net. Uh, Kirk and his um, employee, I can't remember her name, Kirk, I'm sorry. Um, Seth built that website. Um, we're working with Rotary Clubs all over the entire country. Um, it's, it's like ever since the October article came out in the Rotarian Magazine, it's gone gangbusters. I, I get calls daily from Rotary Clubs all over the all over the world, actually, including Sweden and we, what we we just it's just an amazing project and your help and participation would be awesome. So I, I would recommend that we have uh, Chris Stein from the National Park Service talk to you guys about a service project that could be done by youth exchange and all over the world. So that'd be cool. 
We that is really cool. I love that tie-in as a way of bringing the exchange students to, you know, kind of help in their own neighborhood, but have this be a, a global effort. Lindy, is your is your effort, uh, is it specific to the creation of this, and not to spend too much time on this, but your um, the creation of this highway, so to speak, or is this, is the Operation Pollinate, uh, the link that um, Kirk just shared, is that organization you were thinking of? I am just worried about our pollinators. So whatever we yeah. can do to impact and make things better, right? I don't have a specific thing in mind. That's great. Um, wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks. If you are interested in being a part of this or you know having a planning meeting, I would love to be a part of that, Lindy. And anyone else, maybe you can uh, chat, Lindy, uh, just during the meeting here, and we can get a small group or a large group and and see what happens. And Marlene, we'd love to have you on that. Looks like I would love nice. to be there because uh, right now we're working with Monarch Sister Schools and many schools are setting up gardens in their <laughs> grounds. So yeah, it's a good project. Thank you. Please don't forget me. Oh, for sure. Thank you. Glad okay. you're on today. Um, very good. Uh, another announcement is that we have updated our website. I should, I'm saying we. Chris Ann has updated the website. Chris Ann, you have done the nicest job. It's just nice and sleek. And this is a project in the works. We've, you know, step by step, but, um, you know, we'd like to bring a couple of people together on this as well. So I'm making the same request or offer. If people are interested in websites or design or organization or how, you know, is our, um, is our email, and actually, you'd be a great person for this. Does that does this website, you know, adequately sort of communicate who we are? Does it is there an opening for people to join or become members or visit us? I think there's just a lot of cool directions we can go with this. But Chris Ann, thanks for figuring out access, which took us days and days and days, and and uh, moving this forward. Anything you'd like to say on that? Uh, it is a work in progress. I want to update the messaging on the pages. Um, but the, what I do like on here is on the first page, you can get our Zoom link. Mm -hmm. There on the left-hand column and on the right-hand column, you can, um, you can go see our previous speakers. Um, it'll link you straight to, I think it's our YouTube page, right? Or Facebook yes. page, I don't know where, but anyway. It's great. Sure. Everything, everything's right there on that front page. I think that people might want um, in a hurry. Yeah, if people have a design or organization background, if they'd like to you know, just form a small subgroup, you know, outside of our regular meetings, please uh, throw some messages into Chris Ann or myself in chat as well. Very good. And then um, I mentioned our goal: twenty-five members by the end of the year. Uh, hopefully, Brad, you can help us with that quite a bit. Um, our dues are $270 a year, which in rotary terms is about as low as I've seen any club. Um, and really our goal is to make it accessible for all, including new exchange students coming back when money is tight. Uh, we of course would love new members um, anytime. And we also have a friend of the club program for a hundred dollar donation where you can be a friend of the club, help a new Rotary Club get off the ground, access to every meeting and receive unlimited makeups if that's something that is important to you. And that uh, the donation link on the bottom is tinyurl.com slash eclubdonation. Now to go right into um, our, I think it's PayPal account, Kirk, correct? Yeah, our PayPal account. Very good. So, and with that, next week's speaker, An Exciting Life in New York City by Jasmine Hafner. This is going to be super fun. She's a former exchange student. She's, you know, I think many of us, well, I don't know, I'll speak for myself. I, I like sometimes dream in a, in a different life. Maybe I would have ended up in New York and lived this sort of crazy, loud, fast, you know, subway driven life. And you know that's not what life gave me or what I chose. And I've had a quieter Minneapolis life, but it'll really be a fun presentation next Wednesday. So I hope you guys can come and join and John. hear Jasmine's um, presentation. Hey, John. Yes, who's Hi. talking? Ken, that's Rihanna. 
Can I oh, say hey, quick? Yeah, can I just say a quick things about Jasmine's presentation? So Jasmine and I are really good buddies. Oh sure, um, please do. And she and I were talking about her presentation the other day. It's going to be really, really great. So not only is Jasmine an actress, but she's a chess teacher for three and four year olds. Uh, and she's, I mean, it's not just about like acting, but I found through my friendship with her, there's way more about acting that's interesting as people who are travelers and cultural enthusiasts than kind of meets the eye. So it'll be really, really good. Oh, thanks so much for saying that. Yeah, really looking forward to it. I, I don't know her. I think she went out before I was formally involved with um, the committee. So looking yeah. forward to getting to know her. And thanks for jumping in. Mm -hmm. And with that, this week's speaker, it's me. OK, so I'm going to unshare this and, uh, and reshare my presentation. So hello, everyone. I'm John. So <laughs> I'm the uh, e-club president for uh, 2019 through 2021. I may just extend that tenure one more year till 2022. We'll see how the rest of uh, this year goes. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life. I have uh, a game, a game, little game show thing at the end uh, for us. I have some photos and sort of some interesting, um, interesting things that I think you guys will like. So my hometown is Shakopee. Shakopee, when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, was this farming community, really hard to get to. The bridges for anyone in the South Metro, you may remember in the spring, often the Shakopee Bridge would go underwater, then the Chaska Bridge would go underwater, then the Bloomington Bridge would go underwater. And we were really cut off from the rest of the Metro. There were many years where I remember one year, I think the only river crossing open was Mankato and 35W. All the small towns all the way down were, were flooded. Well, they put the 169 bridge. Anyone who's been um, to the Mystic Lake Casino has driven across that, that bridge. And you know the population has just made Shakopee into this super fast growing suburb. Some place that, other than the downtown, which has remained, thankfully, um, very much like what you see here, the rest of the city is just almost unrecognizable. Really cool in a way, bike trails and lake developments and all the rest, but certainly not the place that I grew up in and just different, but still, you know, a, a, a town of pride and just some place I love going back to. Graduated from high school in 83. I did not put in after that. Um, I lived in St. Paul for a number of years. Then I raised my kids in Edina and I now live in Minnetonka or um, Hopkins. Um, for whatever reason, I, I didn't get that in my presentation, I've just realized. <clears throat> Similar to a number of presentations from club members, I have a really strong um, family connection. So um, just like ethnicity wise, my mom's side is Austrian and Polish. My dad's side is English, Irish, German, and um, Swiss. Fun little fact, my great, great grandfather and his brother were both Swiss guards for the Pope in the, uh, the 1860s. We still have um, the, uh, the sword that, um, that has been passed down from generation to generation. So uh, that's kind of cool. And just, you know, these are, this photo that you're seeing are in the center, my, my mom in um, the black, uh, in, in the seated row in the middle, all the way to the right, my stepdad, my uncle and godfather, my aunt uh, and my cousin Mark. So what my cousins, I often say, are more like siblings than cousins. And we still get together, except for this year, um, every Thanksgiving, every Christmas Eve. So super strong family and I, I love them dearly. Uh, unusual connection are our relatives in Austria. So um, in the early 1900s, my great grandmother and her sister at the age of 16 and 17 traveled by themselves to Germany to get on this boat to come over to relocate to St. Paul where their uncle was when they got so these can you imagine this you guys 16 and 17 traveling across in those days I mean, train horse, I, how do you get around, get to the port. And my, my great grandmother's sister had a leg infection and was not allowed to get on the boat. So they had to give each other a hug 
and leave. And I think in the rest of their lives saw each other another two or three times, that was it. But because of that, the families have remained unusually close. So this, these are, um, that generation has, has passed away, but in the center uh, in the red tank top, Razy is my mom's second cousin. Um, a number of the people here are my third cousins. Hedwig is in the light blue next to me. She's another one of my mom's second cousins. And these are, you know, I, weird. It's just very bizarre. I, I will email them and I'll say, guess what? I made the Austrian, you know, um, one of the recipes. And they'll, and this happened a few months ago. And my, um, let's see, third cousin, Ava Maria, where is she? Oh, she's in the, in the maroon all the way to the right, the tall one. She said, this is so amazing. My mother's been sick for so many months. And just yesterday, she made the first recipe for many, many months. And it was the same recipe. These weird, just these weird, really cool connections that, I mean, we all, I don't know if anyone else has connections yet to other parts of the world. If, um, you know, where, where, where there's um, relatives or ethnicity, but I always count this as a really cool uh, part of my life. And I have, uh, I brought my kids over here um, a couple of years ago when we picked Andy up from his Rotary Exchange. Um, and I was like way on the Hungarian border. And fun little fact is there's this little footbridge that you see here and a James Mishner book called The Bridge at Andau. I don't know if anyone has ever read it. It's about the 1956 Hungarian invasion by the Soviet Union. And when hung Hungary was undergoing this big democratic pop, you know, um, movement and when the, when the Soviets came in with tanks, I think people may, you know, remember um, remember this from history or uh, maybe even um, from being around at that time. But this was a, a really, you know, this was kind of what's going on in Myanmar in a way at, at the moment, this, this takeover of a country and people were fleeing. And this bridge, you guys, in 24 hours, how many people passed over and escaped from Hungary before the wall, there's literally a wall, a barbed wire fence with guard stations that eventually went up. That went up within 24 hours. How many people across this small footbridge? 200,000 people escaped over this footbridge. And my relatives, these guys, um, the guy in the white shirt and his brother in the light blue shirt kind of open, third over from me, second over from me, they said we had this is really funny because I speak very little German and they speak very little English. And so we've cobbled together an understanding of what happened, but they hooked tractors up because they, they were all farmers in this farming wine region and they would bring people into town. So the men would drive the tractors and pick the people up, bring them into town. The families would feed them. And get, I mean, this town is tiny, 600 people to, to kind of process or bring 200. So kind of a cool little piece of history, but. Um, Austria, Austrian food, Austrian culture is really, really important to me and, uh, and the family. So. Uh, so my family, this is my dad. My parents got divorced when I was quite young. Um, I think I was 13. So my dad is remarried. This is my stepmom, Barb, and the four of us, myself, my brother, Paul, um, my sister, Kate, on the right-hand side, and my sister, Amy. Amy and Kate both live in St. Paul. Paul lives in Plymouth. And I uh, live here in Minnetonka, right on the Hopkins border. Um, dad and Barb are, are, were in Shakopee. Barb still is. My dad passed away a year ago um, at the age of 87. And what I think is super funny is three blocks away are my mom and my stepdad. So these guys, even though they got divorced, they're still right downtown in Shakopee that first photo that I showed you. And this is my uh, my mom, Joy, she's 81, and my stepdad, Kent. And this photo is taken in our, our uh, annual trip up to the Thunder Bay area. This is my fun early photo that I told some of you about. So this is me and my cousin, Louise. And I spent a lot of time in um, with my aunt and uncle growing up, my godparents. 
And apparently I just loved sitting in that drawer. I would sit there, my aunt said, for hours and hours and I'd play with whatever. So Louise, my cousin, two years older than me, still says, be careful, John, or we'll put you back in the drawer. Like everybody always laughs. So a little cute, early, fun photo. Um, so fast forward to 1983, my Rotary um, exchange year in Oaxaca, Mexico. And um, Oaxaca is right down, kind of describe it halfway between Mexico City and the Guatemalan border. Although the state of Oaxaca has, uh, you know, a couple of many hundreds of miles of beaches. I was in the mountains um, up, uh, up at the capital city of Oaxaca. And this is what it looks like. Mountains were, um, I think the elevation of like Denver, maybe 8,000 feet, super colonial. When I got there, the, the city had just turned 550 years old, um, you know, um, Spanish influence all over. You can see that from the church. Um, Brad, uh, this is a call out to you. Brad and I uh, talked earlier today and I said, I'm still in like basically daily contact with my host families and the high school kids that I went to school with um, uh, through, a, through a group WhatsApp chat. But Brad, just this about 10 minutes before this meeting, my steps, my host sister Anna, who I told you about, emailed me a video that the clock, the clock on this church has been restored and is now working again after many, many years. I just thought it was really funny that we we're just talking about that. And here, here she's just messaged me. And that clock has not been working for many years. So that's really cool. Uh, so Photo of me and uh, the cats on top of uh, my host family's, my second host family's home. I was in charge of climbing up the ladder and seeing how much water had come into the cistern. Uh, we kind of lived on the outskirts of town and water was scarce. So my first host mom, Amelia, she is, um, both my host moms are still alive. Both of my host dads have passed away. Um, Millie, I think would be about 82 or 83 right now, but she's just, uh, she was delightful and such a warm, welcoming person, um, just for exchange. And they had had, uh, they're one of the families that had had, you know, 15 or 20 exchange students, but we, she and I, the family and I just really, really connected. So, yeah. And I've been back, uh, back to Oaxaca about seven times since my exchange. It's my one of the visits. Um, my second host mom, my host sister, uh, that's Anna, that just <laughs> messaged me 20 minutes ago, and uh, her son. So it's just neat as you know the generations go on that families are still connected. In fact, she she texted me last summer. She said, "Well, I have news. Your your mother has gotten married." I said, "What do you mean, my mother has gotten married? Your mother, meaning my host mom, has gotten remarried after all this time." So met a old school chum, and so. Uh, So I went to St. Thomas University uh, here in St. Paul, um, lived around that area for seven years. I have a computer science degree. I have a double major in Spanish and then I have a master's in education. Finished all that up in 92. For my professional life, some of, many of you know what I do now, but this is kind of the progression. I, um, I worked as a programmer, systems programmer for Norwest Wells Fargo. Fargo super, super technical position. And while, um, you know, I like programming, it was um, kind of an extrovert. And this was an, kind of a position in this department of really quiet introvert, introverted people, which is great for the right person. It just wasn't a great fit for me. And I, um, I was really coming out of college on the fence about do I program or do I teach Spanish? Like, which way do I go? And I just decided in 89, you know what? I made the wrong decision. So I'm gonna go back to grad school and um, teach Spanish, which I ended up doing at Cheska High School and Valley View Middle School. In the middle of, of that while going to grad school, I kind of landed in the subway world of franchising and small businesses. I became a general manager of five stores in the um, suburban St. Paul area, Roseville and general area. 
Um, also at, at that time started to do some computer consulting work. I, um, and had an offer to uh, work on kind of a predecessor of Rosetta Stone language learning software. So for me, um, you know, this was the computer programming that I loved, the Spanish that I loved, and the education and the teaching that I loved. And I did that um, for two years. Um, the president of the company developed breast cancer and she survived, but she sold the company. I was, I was out of work and I thought, well, no problem. I will go back to teaching. But in the meantime, I just continued to do this computer consulting and landed in a variety of, I, I worked for Thomson Reuters, um, kind of on legal software. I worked on another Spanish conversion for this big business software thing, downtown Minneapolis. You know, just did a bunch of work for University of uh, Minnesota in the agricultural department and new student um, departments. Um, but I landed in 97, a position, 96, 97, a position with the Minnesota Department of, or uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, Minneapolis uh, Medical Center over by the airport. And that was Alzheimer's focused. And um, that led to another project and then another project. Uh, and then the creation of my company, Healthcare Interactive in 97. So as many of you know, Brad not, but, and Ann not, but others, I do online dementia care training for um, mostly professionals, but also families in the area of dementia care, how to provide better care um, when someone is declining with Alzheimer's memory loss or, or some form of dementia. So the company um, turns 24 years old in June. Um, I'm told that's a bit of a feat for a small business. I think the, the, uh, the statistics are um, at 25 years, only 10% or 11% of small businesses are still around. So I love what I do. I, I feel like I'm making um, a difference socially. I, my days are a little especially with COVID, my staffing is down. So, you know, I'm, I have this marketing um, work that I do and this legal work that I do and the business planning and making sure payroll gets through. I, I, I'm a consummate entrepreneur, small business guy, and, and I love every minute of it. Um, so. In 2003, um, I did a rotary group study exchange. Group study exchange no longer um, is being done. It's, it's transformed to a different program, but the structure of this program was, well, here we went to Norway and we went to five cities for about five or six days each. We stayed, each of the five of us stayed with the family in each of the five cities. And then you were connected vocationally to someone in your same um, industry or profession in each of the five cities. That I, I, all I can say about this program is a, it was absolutely transformational um, to me, my business, who I am, my thoughts about the world, my thoughts about business, my thoughts about how I could run a business and still, it's so funny, you know, these five cities in all within this Rotary District None of them knew each other. It'd be like, you know, um, in any, uh, the Lesur Rotarians get together with the Monticello Rotarians get together with the, uh, you know, the, you might know each other through a committee, but in general, people didn't know each other. And yet, in all of these five areas, I heard the same theme. And one of the themes was, you know, in Norway, there were these just in Norway statements. In Norway, we, we think that the kid should take risks. In Norway, we feel that blah 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 blah. You know, we um, we need to we need to we need to um, do things with energy so that we are in in case that you know we need to sort of build infrastructure. Out. In Norway, we believe that you work until four thirty, and at four thirty, that's enough. Then you go home and you be with your family, and you go outside and you do something outside. You need to get outdoors with your family. It was scripted as if the rotor. It's like it's like. <laughs> the prime minister of Norway sent this memo out to everyone that says, anyone who visits, this is what you'll say. But this was a transformational trip. And I, if you have not been to this country, really, um, you know, spend some time there uh, in the future. It's, it's delightful. Um, this is a picture of our group study group. And on the left, you will see uh, attending um, e-club guest, Mike Morris. He was our fearless leader. 
So the structure of this program was um, uh, established Rotarian would lead four non-Rotarian um, people under the age of 40 on uh, international trips. So Mike was, Mike speaks fluent Norwegian. He understands the culture. He pushed us to learn language and um, was just there to explain everything. So um, the other three people, Lynn and Margaret and um, Elena were, and I, I mean, you know, we became almost like uh, just really, really good friends and remained that way ever since. So this group studying the influence a year later. So this is 03. And in 04, I took my kids back to Norway um, just on a big summer trip. Travel is important to me, and I wanted to bring them over and have them meet um, the families I'd stayed with. So this is, um, we got out to the fjords on this trip, um, did a lot of mountain hiking, and stayed with five families. Unfortunately, my computer crashed in the early 2000s. I lost all of my original GSE Norway photos, but... One of our, uh, Lynn, who was on the trip, dug this one up for me, so at least you could see uh, see part of it. So, which brings me to my kids. Um, uh, many people on the call know them. Um, Andy is uh, 27. He'll turn 28 this month. And Amy is 25. Um, Andy, I think I talk about their exchange. Well, let's see here. So this is when they, uh, this is when they were pretty young. Um, Photo just cracks me up. And this is their mom, Kathy. Um, this is a trip that uh, the three of us are just kind of travelers. We were all exchange students. We all love the world. Um, this is a trip that kind of a friend of, of Rotary who runs a travel company in Brazil helped uh, put together for us. Um, this is a return visit to uh, France and Italy. We've done two of these trips now where we'll go and visit. We'll spend part of um, uh, a vacation in France and part in Italy with Andy and me's host family. So this is in Paris and the two people in the back were Andy's uh, host parents for his year. He was unusually only with one um, family for the entire year, but got super close to them. Uh, and then Amy went to Italy in 2014-15. Um, so another important part of my story, um, I was married to the kid's mom for 10 years. I got divorced in 2000. I was single for five years. And then um, my partner, Matt, and I were together for 11 years until uh, five years ago. So Matt is, um, I couldn't tell the story of who I am without talking about kind of our life together and raising kids together and whatnot. So he came on the scene when um, the kids were quite young. Uh, you know, like many families, we did things like uh, bought two dogs. Emma, Emma can make a cameo here in a little bit. Murphy passed away a couple of years ago, but Emma's laying in her bed at my feet. Um, we built a cabin up in Grand Marais. We, um, you know, back to the importance of family. One of the things that I really liked about Matt from the beginning was how important family was to him. And we were very, very lucky in that both of our families not only accepted both of us, but just really were embracing of both of us um, together and with the kids and as a family. So I'm just eternally grateful for that. Um, also, you know, as with the kids and I, um, Matt and I love international travel. We were we were all over the world uh, together, and <clears throat> my kids. When I took them back to my host city, um, my kids again here during a visit to this is a small village in the mountains of Switzerland, where the Swiss side of the family was from. So that the house, not the brown one that the kids are silhouetted against, but um, the one over, that white house in between, that's literally the family's, my, my great, great grandpa's house that he grew up in. Um, these are uh, some college friends, Mark and Greta and I, who uh, started to travel together in the early 2000s and did these big international trips. And then uh, this is Nicaragua in 2018. My friends, uh, Terry and Michelle, Matt in the background, myself in the foreground. 
Um, let's see if there's one more and then Thailand 2018. So starting with my friends, Mark and Greta and going on uh, with Terry and Michelle and Matt, um, we have done this concept called the mystery trip. So the mystery trip is one of us plans, is given a budget, um, plans a big international trip and um, finds out where we're going the day we uh, leave at the airport. So um, literally we know we're gonna be gone for 10 days or 12 days or 14 days. We show up at the airport, we get through security and we sit down, we do the big reveal. This has, um, this has grown, especially with this group to, you know, full like, um, you know, professionally printed booklets of what we're gonna do. So it's, um, it's been a great way to hang out and see part of the world with people um, that you enjoy traveling with. Uh, I will say the mystery trip concept of not knowing where in the world you're going and showing up to the airport is kind of not for everyone. Um, you have to have quite a bit of trust in uh, the planners and all the rest. But in general, I think um, both my uh, Mark and Greta and I and Terry, Michelle and Matt and I all had sort of the same type of um, travel interests. Like do beaches see something cultural, but not too much of either one, be on the move, but also have a lot of downtime, have a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, if someone doesn't want to do something on a particular day, give them full latitude to do that. And the other two or three will just kind of venture out. So that's been um, just uh, travel. I remember when I got divorced, I said, I don't care what I drive. I don't care where I live. I'm taking my kids on a really cool trip once a year. It just became just became my thing. So really enjoy that. Um, and then gosh, this cabin. So you saw the photo of it going up. This is what it ended up being. Um, this cabin is one hour past Grand Marais. Brad, um, Olga, well, Olga, you may know where Grand Marais is. Brad, Grand Marais is um, 35 miles from the Canadian border in Northern Minnesota. And my cabin is even closer. It's about six miles from the border. It's inland, it's very remote. Um, when we built the closest power line uh, was 17 miles away. So you see the solar panels. Um, I do have that little dish is uh, satellite internet. So some of the comforts of home. Um, the lake is sort of behind me as I'm taking the photo. I love it up here as a, um, in comparison to the crazy life that I live with the company and, um, you know, living in a larger city, this is peaceful. It's quiet. This is moose country and bear country and wolf country. You know, I'll have, it's a little disconcerting actually, you know, to have wolves on your trail cam when you get up there or like, you know, you get up there at 8 PM and look at the trail cam and they've wandered through the yard at 5.30 p.m. Sometimes it's a little, um, but the locals in the area would say, oh, they won't. They don't, they don't want anything to do with you. They're just out looking for food. And I think, well, yeah, I just don't want to be the food, right? <laughs> anyway, five miles from the border, uh, four miles from the boundary water is just a really, really cool, um, place to relax and um, hang out. So indoor shot and the lake. Oh, one other thing to mention is this is, um, it's a state forest lake. So like 90% of the lake is all undeveloped, uh, which just makes it look and feel like the boundary waters for those who have been there. But with the ability to drive in at midnight, you know, have a hot shower, uh, have a microwave oven and, and wireless internet. So that's kind of the end of um, the photos. I let me do a quick time check here. 523. Great. One thing that is really important to me is volunteering. Um, a number of people who have presented about themselves in these getting to know you um, categories have really gone into values or things that are important. And for me, dating way back, volunteering has just been it. 
I um, kind of single-handedly in 93 got this, this programming user group up and going for a program called Authorware that was bought out eventually by Adobe, kind of turned into Flash and now Flash is, is everyone knows out the door. But I held these monthly meetings for programmer developers. It was so fun. It, it kind of reminds me of our group here in a way. We'd get together, we'd have different topics. It was, um, they were in person, but different organizations around the Twin Cities would host. So you kind of got to see what different business, um, you know, physical structures look like. Different people had different projects that they would present. Um, I did that for, uh, I did that for eight years. Um, during that time, I was also a board member of um, Uganda Project. Uganda Project raised money for, um, it started out as tractors, clean water, um, books for Uganda. For those of you in 5960 that knows um, Dave Schaefer, Dave and I go way back to this project. He's Woodbury Club, I believe, or Oak, Woodbury or Oakdale, Woodbury, I think. Um, but what we ended up um, being one of the first to do in Africa was micro um, economic development grants for women. You know, these micro loans where you loan $100 to a woman in a village and um, come up with this plan. They come up with a small business. Literally, this can be from producing a product or selling bananas or um, uh, uh, other things. And over the course of producing and selling, a certain amount of money is um, generated. And then this is, it turns into a cycle where, um, sorry, my phone is ringing and I don't know where, oh, it's crossed, I think so. Um, yeah, and so the idea is that over time, the, the women who are participating in the, the program build up their own amount of money through the savings program and then are able to um, create, uh, you know, more economic, uh, um, you know, stability for their families. It's a great project with tie-ins with USAID and other large foundations. And this is a project that you know, just in general terms has been adopted by many larger organizations than what we were certainly. In 2000, that project shut down and shut down. And um, my friend Greta, who was one of my high school, or, uh, college friends who I traveled with, started, uh, she had done some, um, had a living experience in Ethiopia and started this organization that's still in, intact today, Fill a Mind and Heart. It's Ethiopian hunger and education. Um, for it supports four girls schools and surrounding communities in four different cities of Ethiopia as a board member for uh, six years. Um, I'm a volunteer lake monitor. And I don't know if any of you have seen these, but it's a white disc that you lower down into the water and you record um, on a sunny afternoon um, how far down you can see this. So, you know, what I know is that like the worst that it ever gets at my lake is eight and a half feet of clarity to see this white thing. And the most that I've ever gotten is I think 16 feet. And you do this over the course of, I've been doing it now, what, over 10 years, I think. So th the idea is that at any point, if that changes dramatically, you have data that's just done by a bunch of, you know, people, volunteers, that are able to show um, that something might be going on with your lake. As an example, um, the zebra mussel, invasive species, they eat everything and water clarity gets super clear really fast. So if all of a sudden we started to see, if I started to see average lake clarity of 16 feet or 18 feet or 20 feet, MPCA would come in, they would wanna know, um, or DNR would come in and wanna know what's going on with this particular lake. Um, I just like, I get a kick out of doing it. Of course, Rotary Youth Exchange, I've been on the committee since 2010. We, um, you know, I've been a country officer and on the organizing committee, but I, really my passion is language coordinator to help get kids um, up and going with um, their language before they go outbound or inbound. And as of this past week, because I don't have enough to do, I am an official health partners COVID-19 vaccine clinic greeter at a clinic in Woodbury. And you guys, I, just I, I love it. I found a new a new a new thing I can do for uh, for many years to come. Okay, almost done. Here's my interesting game show. This is the John quiz. Interesting or quirky? You can keep track at home. Okay. Is this interesting or is it kind of quirky? 
I'm a Star Trek and a Star Wars fanatic. I, I have, I, I don't really watch TV, number two, um, but I watch Star Trek box sets. I just keep going through them. I was watching it last night. I live and I quote, and I, I'm convinced someday when I'm in the nursing home, it's it's gonna be like, my head space is gonna be in the 24th century. And hopefully there's someone there that doesn't think I'm too nutso. Um, not a big TV watcher as evidenced by the fact that three years ago, my cable was disconnected because my credit card was hacked. And I didn't realize it for over three months. I did not realize cable was gone for three months. So I'm like, nope, don't need to cut that out. Love to work out. Pre-COVID, I was, um, I'm not an early morning person, but I would drag my butt out of bed. I remember, interesting or quirky, drag my butt out of, uh, butt out of bed, do my 6 a.m. spin class downtown, come back home. I, my goal was to be back in bed by 7.30 to take a nap and then up at 8.30 or 9 and then be to work a little later and then push my day off the other end. I think that one counts as quirky. Love learning languages. I'm recently into Klingon. Uh, again, my, my fanaticism with Star Trek. On Duolingo, that probably is a quirky one as well. Um, love to garden. I have really gotten into building these cool trails, lake level and up into the woods at the cabin. Um, love to drive. I, the cabin I showed you six hours one way. Love doing it. Every Thursday night in the summer, I drive up. Every Sunday night, I drive back. Um, over the holidays here, I just drove out to Montana. It was two days out. I took the scenic route back, three days, um, just to shake things up a little bit. I love to floss, and so should all of you. And I love doing the dishes. A bit of a workaholic, but I do try to balance it with an active life and some relaxation with traveling up with Kevin. I'm the planner. Um, you know, should not come as a surprise to many on the call, but with my high school friends or siblings or cousins or whatever, if there's an event or a dinner or a happy hour or anything like that, I'm usually involved in getting that off the, off the ground. Totally devoted to my kids and my parents, uh, my grandmas when they were alive and my extended family. This is, uh, okay, this one, I, I chuckled, Kirk, thinking of you, because for $1 million, I could not name three Vikings players. That is how much I am not into football. Like, and my kids, are, my kids are both on like four fantasy leagues each and know everything about everyone. And they're like, oh, come on, you could. I'm like, honestly, not, can't do it. Since writing this, I, I, I had learned a second, but that's even gone now. So not my, not what I'm into. Love music. I often am, um, I will often drive to the cabin for six hours and um, sing five of the six to whatever music's on in the car. And I'm super social. Dinners, drinks, movies, walks, staying connected. So there we go. How did I go? How, how'd I do? More interesting, more quirky a little weird, I embrace all. So that is, uh, ta-da, that's my, that's my interesting life, that's me, and uh, in the end. So if, um, if we can all take it while I'm here in the presentation, I'm gonna do it, let's do the rotary four-way test. And then, um, so if you can all take yourselves off of mute. And we'll do the four-way test and then I'll stay on for some questions. So um, so the four-way test, if we can all say this together, the things that we think, say, and do, is it, is it the truth? truth? Is, is it, it all good, 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 goodwill and better friendships? Build, good will, goodwill, 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 goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So there you go, guys. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, so awesome. good, John. Thanks. I think you're hardly quirky at all. Only. Oh, thank you. Oh, I think God. I'm pretty quirky. <laughs> Thanks, I can't Andy. keep up. <laughs> Klingon puts you at the far end of the of quirky. quirky. Yeah. Of quirky. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. <laughs> No okay, matter, but no matter if still... everything else is simply interesting, you're at the far end of the spectrum with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. But there is quirk in quirky. There, there is, there's quirky. <laughs> there's quirky in there. 
I was relieved to hear that you're not the only one who knows nothing about football and can't name three people on any any team, any team. I think Brett Favre is no, he's retired. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, glad. I'm glad. I knew I liked you. <laughs> no, it's I often wonder like where did the kids get it? Like seriously, mm -hmm. they would not they would know. I, I can't even come up with the stat that they would know, but they would know it. <laughs> Great. Uh, I hate to tell you, but I've only seen the original Star Trek movie, and that's it. Well, there's there's time, Greg. Now that you're retired, I can I can come up with a plan for you. I'd rather learn three Vikings players, <laughs> and I don't know those either. <laughs> I what I, the only thing I care about the Vikings is how much impact economic do they have downtown, and the boy that has changed a lot. John, how did you, um, so you did GSE, so now I know how you know Lynn, and now I understand that you know Mike through that. How did yep. you get wrapped up into coming on board with uh, North Star Youth Exchange in 2010? It was because of uh, Lynn, who, um, Lynn Keeler, who I went on GSE with, and she um, was transitioning into the district chair role um, mm -hmm. the year that she did that and needed someone to take her two countries over um, Norway and Denmark and said she thought I would be great. And I needed another big thing to do like a hole in the head. And she said, you know what, just come and, and observe, just sit for <laughs> three orientations and just see what you think. Well, of course I totally fell in love with it. And, you know, 10 years later, here we are. Thanks for asking. That was like the golden years. I mean, that was like my golden years, you know. Yeah. Dana Saran and Greg came in and yeah. everyone was there and it was the best team ever. Yeah, it was a great team. John, if I can tell you a story about Norway. Please do. And your bridge from Hungary into Austria. Yes, yes. My first time in Norway was probably 25 years ahead Hi, of you. Thanks for joining. See you, Mike. 25 years ahead of you. And every Norwegian male that I met took me within two or three hours into the woods and showed me the cabin or the lean-to or the bridge, yeah. whatever it was, where he fought the Germans. And yes, here is where yeah. I killed 12 Germans. Here is where I blew up a train. Here is where I prevented heavy water from going to mainland Germany, et cetera. And that's all they wanted to talk about was the the uh, prevention of the what of the Reich going forward, and they also talked about uh, Norwegian blindness and this terrible disease that Sweden Swedes have. The uh, the border patrol guards in Norway, boy oh boy, they had really good eyesight and they sure could see an approaching Germans, but they just could not see Norwegians. I don't know what it is, but this thing, Norwegians to them were invisible. It was pretty cool. Many of them talked about crossing the border, running across the border and away from the Germans and the Swedes stopping them. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the hosts that I was with during that um, Norway GSE and I went for a run kind of on this trail just in you know, yep. suburbia in one of these, uh, one of the towns where I shouldn't say suburbia, but a mid-sized town. And yep, he said, do you see the, do you see these, um, you know, pieces of fence or these old nails? This is all from, this is all from World War II. I think we, uh, you know, it was a real eye opener for me that um, the extent to which World War II impacted like the whole of Europe. So, yeah. a little crazy. Yep. John. Karen. Your, um, your passion for life for your family. And by the way, I do have to say, I from all generations of your family. I don't think I've ever seen a more gorgeous family. I mean, oh, you're kind. Thank they're, you. They're, what, what beautiful, beautiful siblings you have and your parents and your children. And I mean, all of you, all of you, so but your yeah. passion for life and for your causes and for the people that you love and, and, you know, this newfound passion that you have of volunteering at a COVID vaccination clinic, yeah. it's just, it, it just brings, you brought life to my day today. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for Wonderful. Seeing. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Marlene. Great to see you. Come back anytime. I will. All right. 
I feel like uh, if I would say something, it, 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 I can't trump Karen, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but I can second Karen's comment. Yeah, it was just so, so full of energy, and uh, and and it, I think it reflects what we see every week of you. Honestly, uh, I'm not you. falling off my chair, <laughs> but yeah. it's uh, it's very it was very nice. So thank yeah. you for your presentation and for all you do for oh, thank you. way beyond the yeah. rotary. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, this COVID clinic was, I um, actually didn't know how I was going to like it, but it was, you know, people are excited to be there. They're so thankful. They are just, um, it's a, it, it's neat. It's nice. So thanks, Anne. Thanks for coming here. And yeah, I hope you attend again anytime. Always the same link. And it's always the same time. So Please come back anytime. And I hope, uh, you know, if it feels like a good fit for you, you know, consider membership and. I can't quit. I just, yeah. you know, the, the reason I have been giving back, but I wanted to do it more formally, you know, being after being an exchange student, because I still stay in touch with all of my families that, are, I, that I, yeah. I mean, you know, and there's, I mean, I'm, I'm now helping my host sister's daughter who's studying in New York. Yeah, 